Welcome back, everyone. Uh, we'll get started. So I invite the panelists. So for this um, second session, uh, I did sort of want to revisit many of the questions and themes that came up in that in that first session. And I think um, a lot of people are interested in. And so Maria mentioned the different ways that we may engage with uh, communities. Um, and, you know, this could be the scientific community at a, at a given place in terms of the researcher scientists that are conducting the work and also can be the local community of people that will be uh, donating samples, giving their data or consenting, um, right? And the way, the different ways that you approach that and then getting to some of Sarah's questions, the practicalities of how that actually happens in terms of actually accessing samples, um, uh, who owns the data, the regulatory processes of everything that goes into that. And so I don't know, Maria, if you want to start in terms of the different ways that we may engage with communities and really trying to find out what their interests are versus what uh, your interests uh, are as a scientist and how do you reconcile those? Yeah, I think recognizing your positionality is kind of is, is the first uh, approach. We are uh, well, uh, scientists, researchers in a likely most privileged position that than the communities we uh, or the whose ancestors we might be interested in studying. Um, and I feel something important is when you approach these communities, you should be ready to uh, you should be prepared and accept that even not carrying out the research you're interested in uh, is a possibility, right? I think that's something you should uh, be cognizant on, um, of when you start this project, that you, you, you are approaching community humbly and no might be like a no as uh, might be a, a possibility. And I think that's uh, something important to, to bring up front uh, when you approach communities and be, be ready for that if that's the case and accept it and respect it. Uh, but if if a collaboration can move forward, I think it's important to establish uh, the like the common interests, what are the local communities' interests and how you can, uh, with your toolkit, uh, address those and incorporate other questions you might have on top of that. I think that's um, that's convenient as well. Um, and discuss each stage of the project and the progress. I think it's important uh, um, as it advances and you're getting findings, try to uh, yeah, discuss those with members of the community and involve them also in the publication, if possible, and the situation allows it to training as well. I guess that, that depends on the context and what's the positionality of the researcher and the community you're working with. Um, and uh, well, uh, those are a few aspects. I mean, we could discuss a whole hour about how to do community engagement, but I think those are key. Something I think is necessary to discuss in this particular panel. David? Yeah, I, I think there's some pretty good examples that I've had the privilege to be part of sort of represented in this panel. So I, for example, in the work that I got a chance to do with Jess a few years ago, um, that was like, felt like a kind of iterative process of engagement with communities there. And I think that project is continuing in some form with Jess and Diendo. So I'd be really interested in hearing their experience in working in, for example, some of the sites like Hora and maybe Fingera and and so on. Yeah, sure. I can speak to that because my uh, position on this has evolved over the last 10 years that I've been involved in this. And I feel like it's it's going to just continue to evolve. So, you know, I went into the research because I was very much interested in ancient population histories of foragers. And that was, that was the question that was driving me. I knew that there were um, human remains that had been excavated and we had the uh, the government permissions to do the sampling. And that was all that was needed legally. So kind of at the time I felt that that was, you know, everything was done exactly as it should have been. And I think it was on the basis of what we knew and understood to be the way to go about these things in that moment. 
but since then I've I've spent a lot of time and I mean many, many months living in and amongst the communities around, say, Hora, and just getting to know a lot of people there, community leaders, um, uh, families, people want to know about what it is that we've found. And it should have really gone, I'm realizing, in the other way. You know, we should have been there first asking them what they wanted to know. Many of them didn't even know that there had been human remains excavated from that area in the 1950s. And those remains, of course, were taken, as many of them were in, in those times, uh, somewhere else. And the communities were not even aware that they had been found there. They don't identify with them as ancestors. So there is a, a difference there from many other places. These are people who have a migration story very firmly as part of their oral history and identity. But they are curious, and they do view themselves as custodians of these remains, even though they don't view themselves the direct descendants. And so I. I've been thinking a lot and reflecting a lot through the course of this work about how to better go about doing that. And I think the place that I've, I've come to is that, you know, really we need to be able to um, support researchers in going to places first and having these conversations first, even if it's not necessarily required to do the work um, legally, I should say legally mandated. Um, that that should be the starting place and that there needs to be support for that. I find that in my case, I'm one person. I have a, a great team of, of collaborators and, and people I work with and students, but it all kind of feels often like it's all kind of coming uh, to me to do everything from designing the minutia of the budgets to fixing the field vehicles on the ground under them, <laughs> you know, to having all of the many daily conversations. And really, I think that what needs to happen is we need to be able to think about the support and local infrastructure that we could better support to do a lot of the work that there are a lot of interested people who are very skilled who want to do, but they just don't have the resources to do. So for example, chronically underemployed anthropologists, people locally who are trained as anthropologists who are very well connected to local communities who want to be out there doing the work, but they just don't have the ability to do it because they still have to support their families. Um, and, you know, all of the people in the technical aspect of the pipeline also being able to communicate to people on the ground what it is that's going to happen, uh, what's going to happen to the data afterwards, how these data do tend to live on, how they might be potentially repurposed. Those are things I think that aren't necessarily always conveyed to the same degree to local communities and um, and even to local researchers at different uh, points in the pipeline. So it would it feels to me that there's, uh, I feel like I'm, I'm, I've been happy to be able to be a part of this and I feel like I've learned a lot through it. And I've learned a lot mostly from just talking to people and asking them questions and having them ask me questions. And I think that at the end of the day, there's a huge amount of potential for there to be a building of local infrastructure where there are project managers whose you know, jobs are to, to go through and, and deal with the budgets and logistics and the people, but not deal with them in like a, I have to deal with this kind of way, but you know, in a collaborative way as part of the structure. And that right now it kind of often comes to sort of the lone researcher to, to fill all these many roles and then stuff gets uh, forgotten or lost or, or, or just not done along the way. So I guess that's kind of been my own learning process. And I feel that there's a lot of potential there to the cost of one airfare for one foreign researcher to go to Malawi could support an enormous amount of local effort uh, towards this, for example. David. Yeah, I just want to keep asking because I'm so interested in the way this project has evolved for, for you. Uh, so I know that when we, the work that we published together, Jess, um, in Malawi, um, had a certain form to it. And now I know you've continued working with Diendo, who hasn't worked in Malawi before, but worked in places like Mongolia, for example. And like, how does that, how did that influence, uh, this could be answered by Diendo too, or, or Jess or something, but how did that influence the way you're, I know you're doing work on, on sediments or, or bones, like how has it changed the project as it's manifesting itself now compared to the previous version? Well, I can say that I had a wonderful thing happen where um, recently I was I was working in the area uh, for 
you know, just doing archaeological research, we, we're not necessarily looking for human remains. We're looking for objects, you know, the material culture. Um, ultimately, that's mostly what archaeologists are looking for. And that um, was just what we were doing. And then we were approached by members of the community. Hey, you know, we've unexpectedly found some human remains. And they recognized that there was expertise that they wanted to learn something from. And so they invited us to, you know, it wasn't a matter of us coming and saying, you, we understand you have some human remains and we want to study them. It was very much the other way. It was a wonderful moment because they, I felt I finally had something useful to give them back <laughs> after all of this time. And that uh, became this kind of iterative process whereby they were asking lots of questions about ancient DNA. What can we learn? Uh, here's the questions we've got. Can you do that with ancient DNA? And, um, you know, it's still, it's, but, you know, as we've already heard, these things take a very long time to progress. And so, you know, it's, it's going to be a while before we, we actually see what can come of that. But it was, it was a nice shift. And I think it came from just investing time and, and them seeing that there are people investing time there. They're not just coming in and, and leaving, but they're coming back again and again and again. And they're actually bringing things into the community that are, that are desirable. So, um, when Diendo came out, it was to do sediment DNA sampling, and we're still kind of working on that just to see what the potential is. So I don't know what, what might come of that. He'd be in a better position to speak to that uh, aspect of things. Uh, yes, uh, I mean, I mean, it was, I mean, it was very interesting uh, to work there. And I mean, like the premier question that I have actually like working there is also like mostly about like preservation of the DNA and just like characteristic of the DNA, actually how much DNA we can get from this type, from the samples in that type of like uh, area. So we actually have like the opportunity to have also like some microarchaeologists there. So we could really do a lot of like intensive sampling, like loose sampling, block sampling, and a lot of things going on. Uh, I think unfortunately we don't have all the results yet. Uh, things are not even like totally processed yet, but I think it was also just like very interesting to see uh, what can be done in those type of environment. I, I remember there's also like those like other like sites that are not excavated or like potentially a site and we cannot just go there and make some core sampling there of sediments and then actually try to extract the DNA there before actually there's an excavation there as like to see if we have something, if we are getting something there. So it's like something we could, we could have done also with Jessica, like going from one place that you feel like could be of interest to ex ex excavate in the future and things like that. So, yeah. But yeah, we are still on it. Definitely. It's exciting. Uh, I did want to get to some of the unique sort of ethical and regulatory challenges of working with ancient and historical DNA. So for, for existing populations and individuals, we have in institutional review boards um, to go to approve research with human subjects. Um, for recently deceased individuals, we have their living relatives that might be give consent for their samples. But the further back in time we go and with historical DNA, maybe you have a local community with several people can claim ancestry to uh, those samples. But even further back, when you have ancient populations for which may not be existing any more in sort of any recognizable form, but which several subsequent um, derived populations can claim some sort of ancestry from, who, who are the people that are sort of consenting and giving permission to conduct research with uh, these data? And how do we navigate that? And how do some of you uh, approach those questions? Not a easy shy, shy has question. Yeah. Shy. Um, yeah, I could just comment uh, briefly and also uh, following up on uh, what Sarah said uh, before the break. Uh, it is indeed easier, regulatory speaking, to to work with ancient DNA. Uh, here we have to, um, you know, go through multiple committees, IRBs, and um, for, for studies for genetic studies of um, living people and uh, for ancient DNA. It's, uh, it turns out to be to be easier. You just have to get the approval of the um, antiquity authority, and, and that's it. Um, and I don't know if it's a maybe it's not the 
best thing. Maybe it, it actually studies of ng DNA are more sensitive. It should require um, you know more care from the uh, from the regulator. But but that's at least how it is uh, here. Harold. Yeah, um, to follow up on that, um, it's yeah, it's a very interesting question actually. Who can give consent? And or even because we mentioned before this this resource, um, um, but who who is in charge of a sample and who can you know determine who is going to do ancient DNA research on it? Um, historically, that's often the archaeologists or anthropologists in in whose collections they end up. But if you think about it, at least in some contexts, um, you know. Was there any? There's no process how they got ownership of that. Um, I think it's something we should really think about. I think there will not be a simple answer, and the answer will be highly, highly variable from place to place. Um, but who owns? I mean, you know, it's, as I said before, it's human beings. But who, who can give consent and who can decide where and which ancient DNA research is going to be done? It's a, a challenging question. Do we feel there's enough oversight and regulation already? I don't know, Maria, you have your, your hand up. I mean, so far the answer has been it's easier to do this kind of research, but is it being done in, in, in the proper, responsible, ethical way? Maria? Yeah, I, I wanted to comment. I guess uh, it, it also varies from place to place. For example, in Mexico, the archaeological remains are considered part of Mexico's like patrimony, so the state of Mexico is the owner of all the archaeological remains. So it has to be a government agency who approves uh, the research on, on human remains in Mexico. So there's uh, a review board uh, that receives applications for uh, doing this kind of projects and they decide who gets access and who doesn't get access. But something I can comment in Mexico is that, uh, I mean, this council has existed for decades and only in the last decade is when they started to get applications, especially from people abroad to use uh, samples on ancient DNA and they were completely unprepared to address these uh, requests because they've never heard, like there were there was no one with the expertise to judge whether, for example, the number of samples requested warranted uh, were were enough for this, or, or more than needed for the for the research questions. So, uh, I mean, that was a that was a big issue here in Mexico. Um, yeah, because because of that, right? That they were not prepared. They didn't know the technologies. They didn't understand the applications quite well. Um, and and I, I think one approach. What my impression is that the approach was like, okay, this sounds. This sounds interesting, so let's send samples abroad. And a lot of samples, that's how they uh, left the country. But there wasn't, to me, like a, a, a real good judgment of the science underneath. Um, so yeah, I think that um, things are better now, but for many years it was like that. And um, they're, they're trying to get more um, expertise and advice on these kind of applications, but we're still, I feel we're still way behind in, in this kind of regulations. And they also, when particularly when they are, or they involve pre-Hispanic samples, there's no consultation or any perspective from indigenous people or researchers who, who can weigh in in the appropriateness of the research or the potential harms for indigenous people that's also lacking still. So, I mean, there are initiatives here in Mexico to to be core, become more, um, uh, yeah, to consider those aspects in this application. But I still feel that pretty much anyone can get access to those samples as things stand. So we're getting some questions online. Uh, some of them have to do with their interest in capacity building, what that actually looks like. If there was resources available, what the sort of infrastructure building, capacity building within uh, local communities look like. And Sarah, you mentioned um, sort of analysis, bioinformatics is one way to sort of uh, 
train uh, local people to perform or what else um, can we do in terms of supporting local researchers, local communities, um, given the resources necessary to participate and engage with some of this research? Maybe speak to some of your experiences in, in doing this. So I don't know if you're addressing me specifically, as I said, I study modern populations, which is very different, but maybe some of what we do could be applied. Um, again, it's going to depend very much on the region. There's multiple ways to build capacity. So one is, of course, just building infrastructure in terms of, uh, you know, the equipment that they need or the laboratory space. But that often is more expensive than I personally can do. I'm not going to get an NIH grant, for example, that's going to build a lab there. So there has to be some also government support and a recognition locally that this is important research and that they want to invest in that and they want to invest in the future of that research. So there's going to have to be a combination of sort of the, you know, funding from global organizations. And then locally, there has to be, um, the government has to support this as well. And you, I just recently ran across a case um, where somebody had the most beautiful lab I have ever seen. They had equipment that most people would die for that had been donated as part of a effort to build local capacity. And this was a, a country in Africa. And it was sitting there unused because they didn't have the funding to actually hire the people and to do the research. So there's gotta be multiple, multiple levels to this. And I do think that education at every level is critical. It should be bi-directional. So people coming here, we should be going there um, because ultimately, even if they don't have the local uh, capacity say to generate the data, Nowadays, people, you know, you can go to companies sometimes to generate the data, but they can analyze the data if they have the computational skills. So I do think that's a really important area to build on. Mansa and then Jessica. Yeah, I'll jump on that um, and to say that, yeah, it's, it's true that infrastructure is hard for us sitting here in place of privilege to think about. Um, raising funds or supporting to build in local countries. And I agree with Sarah that there needs to be some level of of, of local um, encouragement there. But, you know, it's it's ground truth. This ancient DNA may not be, at, you know, the priority for certain governments or certain communities. Um, there's far more serious things a lot of these countries are dealing with, right? But that shouldn't make it right for us to justify and drain um, samples from, from some of these countries, right? Um, you know, People may they may not have the know-how today because the infrastructure doesn't exist, but that doesn't mean that if given the resources and time to develop these, they wouldn't be able to carry out the work autonomous, autonomously in their countries of origin. Um, and I think the the other thing, jumping back to your previous questions, is um, IRB is sort of not even the bare minimum. I'm sorry to say, but a lot of these decisions and IRB committees are being administered by people within the biology or the clinical ranks. Um, and whereas ancient DNA in many ways and human demography studies do sort of bleed into many other disciplines. And so not having sort of oversight of social scientists and, and humanities researchers on that also gives a little bit of a blind side to IRB committees who may only be thinking about sort of very, um, you know, sort of shallow ways of thinking about how this data could be used. Um, not to mention when you're working with other cultures, uh, whether it's within the same country of origin or across different countries, there's regional sensitivities that don't even come to play when these decisions are, are being made. Um, and so with ancient DNA, we absolutely, it's it's complicated. There are a lot more stakeholders. Uh, but again, that shouldn't be used as sort of a loophole. In fact, that should make us more accountable to the research questions we're trying to ask and um, and sample one quote for. Um, other things to add, but I also see that maybe other people want to want to speak to this question. Um, actually, I, you said so many wonderful things. That I'm glad that I'm talking after you because that's, um, I think that as sort of the more anthropologist side of things, I mean, I, I see so much um, that could be done really effectively and really make good use of the skills that people already have and the skills that people want to be able to use. And 
to um, to be able to operate autonomously, not necessarily at the level of having to have the most expensive lab um, and not to prioritize that as the most important part of the process. But just to say that when you look at the whole spectrum of things that cost, that have a cost in this whole process, some things cost an extraordinary amount of money and some things cost less. And so if you think about kind of a, a way to make meaningful use of local infrastructure that exists, it doesn't necessarily have to be um, conceptualized exactly the same in every single context, right? It doesn't need to be a matter of every country has to have, you know, a full ancient DNA lab in order for there to be meaningful contributions. And kind of acknowledging that there are already many underutilized um, people with skills in many different roles that they could happily play and that it doesn't have to be what I guess has been traditionally considered to be a more or less prestigious role in order for it to be equally important as, as a part of the whole process. And so I think there are ways to maximize resources. In other words, by investing in, in people locally that are not always necessarily going to have to be doing the super technical aspects that can be more expensive and require more actual physical infrastructure. Thanks. Uh, we're going to wrap up this session now and move on to the last session, which is uh, <clears throat> looking at how we can use ancient and historical DNA to better understand uh, modern human diseases and traits and some of the sort of more scientific questions of the uses of uh, this data. Um, and so I'll just start with a sort of broad question first um, for anyone is, how do they feel about the level of insights that we may gain from historical and ancient DNA in terms of understanding current health conditions, current diseases, and current populations uh, around the world? Do we see a, a large uh, benefit of that? Uh, David, I, I see your hand raised. So my my question is, you, you suggested that it might be helpful to share maybe a slide or not. Do you want me to do that? Because I did prepare a slide that would take me one minute to share, but it was a sort of an example of that, or I, I don't have to. Sure, one minute, sure. <laughs> so, uh, um, do you see this? Yep. So I think that what's happening right now is that like the hope for ancient DNA has always been it would be as powerful for learning about biology as history. And I think that that really required large sample sizes, as Ian said, sort of Ian led this study in, um, 2015 that analyzed 230 people with whole genome data and found 12 places where there was significant selection. And I really think that that's now, that power is really uh, being realized by seeing hundreds of places with potentially genome-wide significant of selection. And you can see, for example, variants like celiac disease and gluten insensitivity that are rapidly increasing in frequency in the last 4,000 years under what pressures, why, and these are major, major risk factors for disease or risk factors for uh, type 2 diabetes, like adiposity measures that are decreasing quite radically over the, under the pressure of selection over the last 10,000 years. Um, and this is really based on the big sample sizes that are available now from Europe and Western Eurasia. But in principle, it's possible to do this also in other parts of the world. This is a study that was our collaboration with Mercedes Okamura in Sao Paulo and Brazil. And even though the sample sizes are much smaller, it's very clear that we're beginning to find genome scale uh, region, uh, locations that are that are significant, that are affecting traits and people of, of Native American ancestry from this part of the world. So it's really driven in terms of the insights about biology, in terms of by sample size and the ability to form these studies. So I just wanted to share this slide because it shows what can begin to be done relevant to disease from my perspective. Thanks, David. Um, yeah, so that was sort of my question, given, you know, it's hard enough uh, from sort of modern genetic association studies to get insight into disease biology and mechanisms and then translating that um, into possible interventions, treatments, and whatnot. What 
can ancient and historical DNA really help us in that direction? Is it really going to help us understanding biology or why there are certain disparities and equities and diseases and traits across different populations? Uh, right? Is it really going to push us in that direction? Do we see hope um, for that data and helping us achieve that? I'd be very interested in Ian's perspective on this. The end all you have your hand up. <laughs> Uh, yes. So uh, for my part, like especially working with sediments and ancient environmental DNA, I, I I I tend to think that like definitely environmental DNA can also like will help us to like address a lot of these questions because definitely like all those uh, selection events or something happen like in the time and like in response of like change in the environment. And for me, I, I really hope like that's like the direction I, I try to go with also all the sedimentary DNAs, just try to really like profile the whole like environmental DNA that I have in my samples and like profile like also like microbial DNA, like pathogens and stuff in all of the samples, but also looking at like resources, like like potentially uh, give information about like diet and, and also even about like climate and things like that. And trying to like with all those like, change that we see but like looking at the human genomes and if you can associate that with like some very like change in environment or like presence absence of some pathogens that we can or not find in the environment i think that would be kind of a powerful approach to also like resolve those question about uh about selection and about disease and like just put the, the historical context on 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 those like modern disease Ian? Yeah, I mean, I completely agree with Diendo. I think that one of the really powerful things that's uh, sort of coming out now is, is these sort of large scale scans for pathogen DNA and looking at pathogen load across different populations. And, you know, I, I think, I mean, it, it's not, it's hard, I think, a little bit to see how these ancient DNA studies really get you closer to the biology. But I think maybe that sort of thing is is one way where you know, you can see possibilities where if you see things that are, for example, selected, you know, in conjunction with particular pathogens, that sort of gives you a clue as to what's driving it. And maybe that gives you a little sort of chink into the biology. So I think that's kind of the, um, I, I think that those are the kind of, those sort of integrated studies are the kind of things I'm most excited about. I think the other thing I'd say is when it comes to health disparities, you know, one of the questions that I think maybe you can answer using ancient DNA is, you know, of health disparities that we observe today, you know, which of those have a genetic basis versus an environmental basis? And, you know, I think that, you know, for things like, for example, you, you know, examples of local adaptation, which can lead to a genetic basis, again, will change the way that you think about those kind of health disparities. So I think that, you know, those are sort of the two things where I think that, um, that this kind of study can really sort of speak to modern day to to, to modern health uh, and the genetic base of complex disease, but you know, with the caveat that you know it, it's got to be a crosstalk. So we've got to you know you you have to sort of integrate what we've learned from GWAS and other sort of traditional studies of complex disease with the ancient DNA data. I think that's still something that we we struggle with a little bit on a technical level. You know, for example, when it comes to things like polygenic scores, which have all these sort of documented issues. Maria? Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I, 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 I like uh, what Ian just said. I, I'm very interested in pathogens, and I like uh, um, how the study of these pathogens is telling us some, um, some aspects of the pathogens themselves, but also of the hosts and their demographic history, too. So I feel that's a, an, a, an avenue. And then I'm going to say something that might be a bit uh, a bit controversial, but that's how I've seen it from, from my perspective. Because I draw some, um, I feel, I sense some similarities when people discuss like personalized uh, medicine and they say like that's kind of the future and it's going to change the way we uh, cure people. And yeah, we... That's the promise, right? But then I see many of the health issues we face today don't require this like 
very specific genetic profiling of peoples. I mean, they're way more of a basic needs, like just clean water, right? That will um, kind of improve substantially the health of like millions and millions of people. So that's, I, I found it uh, a bit absurd sometimes when people think about the promise of personalized medi medicine to improving health of, of, of humanity. And I think that's just having a very narrow view of what are the health problems of the world at this moment. So I, um, I'm kind of sensing something similar when we talk about tension DNA as a promise to improve uh, medicine and I said this this could be controversial because we all like ancient DNA and we it's very nice to put in our grants these kind of things because we will get funded right um, but I think it's important sometimes to have these angles too and, and reflect on them so I wanted to get back to an earlier point about sort of question driven research and I was wondering if our current sort of models, our current sort of analysis methods, are they sophisticated, mature enough where if you ask a certain research question, you are able to sort of know, you know, at what time points you need a sample in terms of ancient historical DNA, how densely you need a sample, and what you need to ask from a, a local community in terms of the data you need? Or are we still sort of figuring all this out, how sophisticated are our current approaches to really uh, drive um, uh, the way that we uh, do this research? Are we... Sarah? Well, it just seems intuitive to me that it depends on the questions. Right, because as we heard uh, David and Ian and some others mention, let's say you're interested in the um, identifying targets of natural selection, uh, genetic variants that play a role in adaptation. You have to look at the trajectory of the allele frequencies over time. You have no, ch you have to have really, really dense sampling to be able to do that. If you wanted to make inferences about demographic history and you know you're able to get really decent quality, say whole genome sequence data. Uh, you don't need a lot of genomes to be able to make those inferences. Now, those inferences can help also those of us who are studying modern samples because of lot, a lot of the questions we're trying to address, we need to have good demographic models. And in places like Africa in particular, the demographic history is so complex. It is just so challenging that I'm just hoping that you guys are going to come up with methods, you know, or ability to look at the ancient DNA you know, for all the reasons we've talked about in that region, because it's really going to help us to disentangle this complex demographic history. And that kind of could have important implications for those people studying modern genetic variation as well. Anyone else? Um, Shai? Yeah, I would like to point out more generally regarding the value of uh, ancient DNA is that I, I think one way this could be summarized, like the value is that it permits us to study a lot of uh, natural experiments. Like let's say if we want to to understand what is the impact of the Black Death, as I mentioned earlier, or certain diet, then you know nowadays we only have the populations that that we have today, you know, around the world. But but with ancient DNA we can look at the entire history and now we have lots more you know like thousands of years of of uh, such natural experiments and we can use them to to learn um how they affect variant frequency and so on and and thereby learn about uh, biology and the, the response to the environment so this is a uh, one crucial value of uh, um having access to ancient DNA in my opinion Jessica I think there's some social value that could be, um, if if sort of executed well and in close collaboration with people who have concerns about particular health issues, I think that if they um, feel that the ancient DNA has given them some insight, let's say, into their own population history and are able to use that to um, kind of motivate people around them to say, hey, for example, with diet, 
there have been enormous changes in what people eat, obviously, globally, but at different paces and different ways. And then there are huge disparities in nutrition. And a lot of, in Africa, a lot of reliance on aid and a lot of reliance on particular staples that aren't necessarily indigenous staples. And what ancient DNA does is it gives you the opportunity to look at the kind of the before, the during, and the after. Um, some of these things that are still impacting people today. And even if maybe no great insights have been learned from it in the sense that maybe we learned that there's been some detriment or some sort of selection uh, for particular alleles because of it, at least kind of having that knowledge might be something that makes um, people feel empowered to be able to speak to one another and then also to self-advocate for why they might need particular um, make requ particular requests, for example, regarding nutrition or health or, or availability of certain foods. I'm, I'm just kind of thinking about like the power of knowledge um, when given back to the people in communities that really actually have the health concerns. And, and maybe that is a benefit rather than necessarily a massive scientific revealing or revelation of, of something we didn't you know, already kind of suspect beforehand, if, if that makes sense. Uh, Ian? Yeah, I guess I, I just wanted to sort of add to that, and, and perhaps to my previous comment, that I think we do have to be a little bit careful in sort of managing communication and expectations of the way in which we uh, we, we say these things, because, I you know, we talk, obviously, we focus on differences we focus on local adaptation, we focus on natural selection and, and, and things like uh, changes in diet. But, you know, in the end, those things probably don't have a very large ab impact in absolute terms on, on health and health disparities. And this also goes back to, to Maria's point, right? So, you know, I, I, I feel a little bit uncomfortable sometimes, you know, when my, my lab works on, on natural selection, we're always talking about natural selection, but actually, you know, even in terms of genetic differences among populations, I think that's a very small force. So, you know, I, I think we just have to be, be, we have to avoid giving people the idea that really, you know, we think that all these differences are explained by selection and, you know, or like agriculture and thrifty genes uh, affecting our health, because, you know, in the end, there's not a, a huge amount of evidence that in absolute terms, that's a large contribution. So, so getting following up one of Jessica's points in terms of just the generation of knowledge is are there any sort of traits, um, phenotypes, um, uh, research questions that perhaps we should not be applying ancient DNA to? Like how do we sort of draw the line between uh, the generation of scientific knowledge uh, versus um, socially sensitive uh, topics and areas of research and how people may misuse or misappropriate agent DNA data. Sarah. So I don't want to address that yet. <laughs> um, others may have a good answer to that, but just something that Ian was saying about, um, you know, that selection may not be the super strong force, but over time, as he knows, even a very small amount, you know, low, not super strong selective force makes changes. And if what we are interested in are identifying um, is identifying functionally important variation, what variants are impacting phenotypes? And some of them can have important effects. And I'm thinking something like ApoL1, which plays greatly increases risk for kidney disease, um, very common in certain populations, kind of a mystery, because it's not all Western African populations, it's just certain ones thought to be under selection due to uh, resistance to a type of trypanosome that causes sleeping sickness, but today's only in Eastern Africa. Was it even in Western Africa in the past? Maybe we can learn that from ancient DNA. So I just want to put a plug in there that I do think it can help you to target functionally important variation. Now for the tricky question, I will let somebody else answer that. Any brave soul? Hi. I think obviously, you know, when we're talking about cognitive and behavioral traits, I mean, they are the most, uh, um, you know, they're very complex and um, 
they are also subject to confounding in, in modern uh, in, in genome-wide association studies in modern populations. And I think there, there are good reasons for people who would say uh, the methodology is not there yet, uh, just too complex and, and you know, it's not it's the right time to study them yet. But, but also I, I'm aware that some people um, think it is possible with the right methods. Maria? Yeah, well, I actually think Ian brought up very important points. I uh, answering to to answer this, like the risks of uh, like highlighting differences between populations, um, and kind of reinforcing reinforcing the idea of of races as well. Uh, I think also there is a risk when trying to study like complex phenotypes, especially associated to to disease or. Uh, phenotypes that can be associated to like uh, or like ra racialized uh, phenotypes as well. I also believe like predicting phenotype from ancient DNA can yield to some sometimes controversial uh, discussions, uh, particularly in the case of ancient D of ancient pathogen DNA that I that I study and something I try to be very uh, cautious with is trying not to um, kind of uh, portray certain populations as carrier of diseases. Like uh, that's that's also very important in my research. Like not to try to associate a disease to a population. Um, so basically, it's anything that can kind of contribute to ongoing uh, controversial discussions about race. Uh, it has it 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 has this risk. Right to to reinforce some ideas or some ongoing discussions in the present. Uh, those are are just some ideas that come to my mind right now. Uh, Harold, you had your your hand up. Lost Harold for a minute. Um, yeah, so I was. I mean, I, I, sorry, I'm not sure if my hand. Up. Sorry, no, it's not not oh, there I see it. Go recognized. Ahead, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes, right. I've had a I don't know, is it not visible? But um anyway, I just wanted to add that I completely agree with everything um that's been said. I just wanted to add a little bit to that and say uh beyond what we from our you know, from our particular biased and informed positions can think of as being potentially controversial subjects of study here. Um, there may also be taboo um, subjects that are specific to communities. So I think, again, going back to the second session about um, the right timing about framing your questions and analyses around consulting with communities on what, what may be potentially taboo in their specific um, region, uh, whether it's taboo in terms of how the, the government or the powers to be look at these communities or even within the communities themselves. Uh, for example, something as straightforward as we think in our data analysis is looking at the levels of endogamy or consanguinity in some of these communities can actually be fairly taboo and could also propagate harms. So I think, again, going back to the consultation phase um, of, of the project design is important. So we're wrapping up pretty soon coming up to the hour. I was wondering if anyone had some final thoughts uh, that they'd like to share. I do want to say something before I'm, I'm not going to put my hand up because I think it's just not yeah, visible yeah, for yeah, some reason. Yeah. But I think this is a very um, timely and, and kind of a, a great platform to maybe um, articulate some of the, these sentiments, which is that, um, you know, of course, at the at the at the sort of bottom level of this, you know, the researchers need to be accountable to the way that we do the science, the way we are asking questions, the way we are engaging, and the way we are communicating our science. But I think, um, you know, oftentimes uh, the role of the funding agency and institutional support, whether it's in the form of IRBs or even sort of setting goals for researchers and the pace at which some of this research needs to be done um, tends to interfere in sort of the, the way that we should be thinking about research practices. So I think we need to also bring in, um, in ways like this, um, you know, funding agencies and other stakeholders um, to the academic process into these conversations, so.
the end of? Yeah, uh, for me, I was like thinking exactly the same f- the, the the same thing. I'm Manessa was saying. I mean, I think there's like much more like talk between us uh, scientists about like uh, ethical consideration things, and like I think from all those talks, I really see that we have we are just limited into what we actually also can do. I mean, we are not ethicists, but also most of the time we don't have enough funding to kind of like invests into the ethics and, and everything that, that that it takes. So I think it's very important to have those type of like meeting uh, with like officer from like funding mechanisms and stuff, like to see like also the way, because like for me, even like I, I, I have like, I'm just starting my lab and looking for fund and doing ancient DNA and being confronted to like all those like new consideration they're just like above me in my bench or in front of my compu- computer and trying to like finance my research and not even be able to know how to articulate the the that part of the work in my funding proposal. So I think it's just like good that, that we have that opportunity uh, to discuss also about the things with like funding mechanisms and 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 so on. So yeah. Maria. Yeah, thanks. I think this panel has been uh, a really good forum to bring up very important issues. Um, and I think something I I would kind of reflect on is, so we 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 started with this map you showed, and we discussed about these disparities as, that exist and these gaps that exist. And at, then we discussed the potential of ancient DNA in different forms with with some um, discussion about the like the how real are these promises and the risk and so forth, but there is definitely a potential in in ancient DNA research. So I think my comment or, or what I would leave uh, as, a, as a very important take home is as a funding agency uh, that the NIH is, I think the goal should be to help develop this potential while not widening the gap that already exists, but narrowing it. I think that should be one goal. Like, yes, we should develop this potential that there is, but there is this gap. And uh, and this gap, I mean, between uh, like geographical gap between research groups, et cetera. So I think we, we want to avoid widening that gap. And, whatever we can do should narrow it instead. That could be kind of a, a very important thing for me to leave after this panel. Jessica. I think as the archeologists in the room, I have to say, uh, you know, I think you can imagine the difference between the funding that's available to do archeological work and the funding that's available to do other kinds of <laughs> more medically inclined work. And um, it's been really rewarding to be able to collaborate with ancient DNA um, practitioners and be able to be a part of developing the questions and and actually helping to write the papers. But I, I don't think that it's always the case that archeologists are that deeply involved in developing some of those questions. And so there's a lot of Questions, you know, we've talked about question-driven research that that really could, I think, fruitfully be explored through more explicit um, opportunities to co-design projects and and the questions around them with people who know the history and know the archaeology really deeply, rather than kind of always having our separate spheres and then you know citing one another's papers or uh, you know coming in later in the process. And uh, the funding is a, is a serious obstacle for those of us who produce the data at the ground level, out of the ground. And um, so I think kind of if we're going to be thinking about the future of ancient DNA, we also have to be thinking about all the steps, like the recovery of it out of the actual sediment, and then what happens to the curation of the remains afterwards, and how are they going to be managed in a way that is um, acceptable to the local communities and the local governments, and uh, what part you know does this kind of research have to play in that because um, you know it doesn't kind of end when the paper is published. So there's a lot of work that's invisible um, b- below each of these ancient DNA studies, I think, 
that isn't always necessarily recognized at the funding level or the university level for that for that matter. So we are at the end uh, of the hour in the webinar, and I want to thank all our panelists for participating in a, in a great discussion. As a reminder, a recording of this will be posted uh, on our website in the coming weeks, and we'll, we'll put out a summary, public summary of the workshop and some of the discussions we've had. Again, thanks everyone. I mean, I think this is a start of a conversation that will keep on going, and, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, bye-bye.